what he said to those families right there in court, saying, I'm sorry, apologizing. Then what he confessed next, our team is there. Also breaking another governor in the South, taking action tonight, this time executive order, saying the Confederate flag must come down just as that beloved pastor is honored. The deadly storms, the power going out for half a million, the Amtrak train stranded. And at this hour, the new storms now powering up. Reports of five people hit by lightning. The growing mystery outside one American city tonight, at least four women now dead, the FBI joining the investigation. And caught the patient who accidentally records what his doctor was really saying while he was under anesthesia. You will hear it for yourself tonight. From ABC News World Headquarters, this is ABC World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening, and it's great to have you with us here on a Wednesday night. And we begin in Boston tonight, bomber Jokar Sarnayev in court to be formally sentenced to death. We knew he would have a moment to talk, but we're unsure if he would use it. He did talking to the victims and their families, so many showing up to the federal courthouse, addressing Sarnayev, calling him a coward, despicable. Then Sarnayev himself with a message for his victims and their families. ABC's Ron Claiborne leading us off from Boston with what he said. He entered the courtroom smiling, but just moments before he was formally sentenced to death, Johar Sarnayev spoke for the first time, softly and without emotion. I am sorry for the lives that I've taken, for the suffering that I've caused you, for the damage that I've done. Without ever turning to face the victims gathered in the courtroom, he confessed to his crime. If there is any lingering doubt, I did it along with my brother. That stunning moment following three hours of gut-wrenching impact statements from victims like Bill Richard, seen here on that day standing with his family, Zarnayev just a few feet away, he chose hate. He chose destruction. He chose death. This is all on him. Richard's eight-year-old son, Martin, was killed. His then seven-year-old daughter, Jane, had her leg amputated. Rebecca Gregory lost her leg, too. You and your brother have lost. You unified us. In the 800 days since the bombing, Darnayev has only been seen in that prison cell surveillance video, never taking the witness stand at his trial. But today he said he heard the pain of those who testified against him. I was listening, the suffering that was, and the hardship that still is. Never apologize for a thing, that's it. That's all I gotta say. I wanted a sincere sorry. I wanted to know, you know, uh, but I don't think it really matters. No, he's, he's not uh, sorry. If he was sorry, he would've never did that. Zarnayev will eventually be moved from Boston to a prison in Terre Haute, Indiana, which is where federal death row inmates are held until execution. Tonight, his lawyers are saying they will file an appeal of his conviction. David, that could take many years. All right, Ron Claiborne leading us off from Boston. Ron, thank you. And to the South tonight, and a dramatic new move from another governor when it comes to the Confederate flag. And the decision comes just as a community paid its respects to Reverend Clemente Pinkney, the leader of that Bible study at Mother Emanuel Church, lying in state inside the rotunda of the South Carolina Capitol building flying outside that Confederate flag on the State House grounds. Meantime, the governor of Alabama now taking executive action. ABC's Lindsay Davis in Charleston tonight. White, black, young and old standing at attention today as a horse-drawn caisson bearing the body of the Reverend and Senator Clementa Pinckney arrives at the South Carolina State House. Why did you decide to come out? 100 degrees, long lines, and you're going to be out here a long time. Well, it doesn't even feel hot out here today to me. I feel like this is my duty to come out here. The hundreds of people here to pay their respects for Reverend Pinckney lined up in the shadow of this controversial Confederate flag. But in just the past 48 hours across the South, a movement to strip Confederate symbols from public spaces. In Alabama today, the flag removed from the Capitol grounds at the governor's orders. It has become a distraction all over uh, the country right now. In Mississippi, both Republican senators saying the stars and bars don't belong on their flag. In Kentucky, officials wanting this statue of Confederate President Jefferson Davis out of the state house. And four states now planning to ban license plates with the Confederate emblem. Here in South Carolina, powerful Congressman Jim Clyburn is lobbying fellow lawmakers. What would you say, though, to convince those who are still saying, let's keep the flag up? You're not celebrating heritage. You're celebrating hate. 
But at Dixie Outfitters in South Carolina, business is booming with shoppers like Tammy Jackway. Just because one person does something um, that isn't right, that hurts other people, we shouldn't just, you know, say we're just going to get rid of a flag that represents thousands of people that have died. The flag is still flying here at the State House, but tonight, South Carolina's historic military college, the Citadel, has voted to move theirs. One of the victims of the shooting was a Citadel graduate. David. Lindsay Davis, our thanks to you again tonight. We turn now to the deadly storms and the new threat tonight. At this hour, 30 million bracing for round two. Flash flood watches from Chicago to Des Moines, just 24 hours after a massive storm system marched all the way to the East Coast. A tree snapping in half in Washington Township, New Jersey. This car flipped upside down in Deptford. Powerful lightning over Hoboken, New Jersey. And there is late word coming in at this hour of five people struck by lightning at a construction site in Colorado Springs. Three taken to the hospital, one in serious condition as those new storms move in. Ginger Z with the storm tracked in a moment, but first Tom Yamas on the ground where they're still recovering from the first round of storms. Tonight in parts of the Northeast, homes, cars and fences broken and buried underneath piles of trees. This cell phone video shows the storm slamming Washington Township, New Jersey. That tree trunk snapping like a twig. It was very terrifying. Uh, when this tree came down, the whole area shook. 75 mile per hour winds slamming into parts of New Jersey and Pennsylvania, strong enough to flip this car over. A confirmed tornado tearing up Rentham, Massachusetts. The storms leaving half a million in the dark and about 50 passengers stuck on this Amtrak train for hours. There was no electricity. It was hot. It was uh, really very stuffy. In Maryland, the storms are being blamed for a traffic death. A man driving a pickup truck hitting a tree that had fallen into the roadway. And new video out tonight that shows the sheer force of that EF1 tornado that hammered Portland, Michigan, breaking this tree clean off. Back in South Jersey. Disaster. <laughs> Yes, I never saw anything like it. Resident Bob Ayers thinks a tornado hit his backyard. When the storm rolled through, he says he looked out his window and saw something he'll never forget. The tree was falling just at that minute, just, and it hit the house. I can't believe the power of it. And David, look at that car absolutely crushed by this massive tree. Because of this damage, many here thought a tornado had touched down, but the National Weather Service says this was not a twister, just powerful straight line winds. David. All right, Tom, our thanks to you. Let's get right to Ginger now because, as I said, this is powering up in much of the same area. Yes, and straight line or tornado, whatever you get here tonight, it's still very powerful and can be deadly. So let's look at the severe thunderstorm watch in the southeast. We've already seen severe thunderstorm warnings, some 30 reports or more in parts of Georgia, Alabama, even Mississippi. But it's overnight that I'm concerned about the area here in flash flood watch from northwest Indiana back into eastern Iowa. I put on a computer model here. Look what time it is, 1 a.m. Central Time. Eastern Iowa blowing up with strong storms. Again, some of the heaviest rainfall rates could top two plus inches per hour. So that's tonight. Then tomorrow, that an elevated risk area includes Cincinnati and Evansville, but we'll keep that chance all the way to D.C. All the way east, all over again. Ginger, thank you. And as you know, there are also dramatic images coming in at this hour from Southern California. A fast moving wildfire outside Los Angeles. You can see how close those homes are. Evacuations underway as aircraft fight the blaze from above. One firefighter now injured authorities in California tonight now saying they're facing the worst fire conditions on record. We have major new developments in the case of those convicted killers on the run now believed to be armed and dangerous. Tonight, a new clue from inside that hunting cabin, much like this one in those upstate New York woods. They believe those cabins in the area had guns inside and now fear those guns are in the hands of the convicts. And stunning new revelations about the woman, the prison worker accused of helping them escape. ABC's Lindsay Janice is there again. Tonight, as police comb these dense woods, a chilling warning about the escaped killers. Just about every cabin or outbuilding in the North Country has one or more shotguns or weapons. They're extremely dangerous. They're cunning. Police found their DNA on food in a remote hunting cabin. They also found a bloody sock and are hoping one of the men may be injured. We don't want them to have a restful, peaceful night putting their head on any pillow. We're just outside of the search zone here, but you can see what officers are up against. This terrain is steep, it is dense, and you can sometimes only see just a few feet in front of you. Joyce Mitchell, who worked in the prison tailor shop, already charged with helping the killers escape. Prosecutors say she had a relationship with both Richard Matt and David Sweat.